everyone. Uh, we're live on Facebook with Dr. Richie Shoemaker, who's here in audio um, today. And I am really excited to introduce uh, a longtime colleague and someone I respect just because of all the pioneering work he has done in the field of mold related um, illness, sears, and anything related to biotoxins. Um, what we're going to go today deeper into is the genie test that he's developed along with uh, colleagues, and we're going to dive into what that actually looks like and why this is groundbreaking research, including the recent uh, published review article that I have here on my desk um, from Trends in Diabetes and Metabolic Disease about hypometabolism. So we're going to dive into that, and I will let Dr. Shoemaker explain. Before I dive into um, that, just a few housekeeping. You can find us uh, here. This will be recorded. You can watch it later if you missed it the first time. And be sure to check out my YouTube channel, all free videos, just interviews with other um, physicians that have great uh, content for you. So Dr. Shoemaker, Dr. Richie Shoemaker is a recognized leader in patient care research and education and a pioneer in the field of biotoxin-related illness. Um, he has dedicated his life and career to uncovering the link between the toxic slew found in many of our buildings and homes and the vast amount of misdiagnosed, as any of you who have been in this world as patients or have family members that have been sick, you know how this goes. You get shuffled around from doctor to doctor to doctor, and then um, no one really understands what's happening or finds solutions for you. So this has been really groundbreaking because he has been an absolute leader and one of the first to pioneer what's actually happening with patients who are exposed to biotoxins. Um, so this, uh, we often assigned this fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and again, hypometabolism, weight gain, et cetera. And we put them in these categories, but we're not really looking for the root cause. So again, Dr. Shoemaker has been absolutely instrumental by uncovering the real sciences behind these illness and attacking the problem with clinical studies and sound research. The other thing he does is he's publishing, he's actively researching and publishing um, peer reviewed in the literature for the things that we're talking about today, which is exciting because that's what really um, brings the science forward. Uh, he led the way in not only identifying the true cause of these afflictions, but also um, curing many in his community that were deemed incurable. He truly feels it's imperative that patients educate themselves, and now he's committed his time and resources to providing the tools. So his website is survivingmold.com. If you've been around for any sort of time, I'm sure you've seen his website. Tons of resources there, lots of research. You can do a visual contrast test there. You can um, just download all kinds of uh, great information, and I know you're continuing to keep that up to date. So Dr. Shoemaker, thanks for that long introduction. Welcome, and thank you for joining me today. Well, well, thank you for having me. This is quite a pleasure. Appreciate the invitation. Yeah, it truly is. It really, really is. I, I have, like I was telling you before, um, and just to be public, I have the utmost respect. You really, truly were one of the pioneers that started to name what was happening and describe for the rest of us physicians um, some of the underlying mechanisms that before that were not understood and were not put together as far as how it could relate to an environmental exposure. And again, what we're finding now and what I want to learn from you today is it's not just mold. It's this water damage slew that includes all kinds of um, things that activate the cytokine response. Before we jump into that, I want to hear a little bit about, I know your story, many people do, but tell us a little bit about way back um, when you first got into biotoxin illness and how that all, how that happened in your life. Well, it's 25 years now, my, my silver anniversary uh, since the days when I was a very happy uh, rural primary care physician and solo practice beautiful neck of the woods here in the bottom of the Eastern shore on the east side of the Chesapeake Bay. We can see Washington someday. Oh no, that's Sarah Palin can see Russia. I thought <laughs> I got that wrong. We can't quite see Washington, but we can certainly see beautiful scenery and it's an idyllic place to live and raise a family. And I was pleased to be a primary care physician uh, and doing what I wanted to do as an outpatient practice. And along comes some looming disaster in the waterways. The Pocomoke River drains into the Chesapeake Bay. There's 22 other estuaries that we were worried about, as it turns out. But something happened. They, they, our habitat changed. Fish that normally would swim away rapidly when here comes a boat or somebody else started acting erratically and swimming in circles. And there were a few fish kills in 1996. And people who worked around the fish kills harvesting live fish, uh, we call them watermen. You might want to call fishermen, but they get crabs and oysters, and that's how you say oyster. It's oysters. I got to be proper here. 
but specifically these folks had direct contract with with droplets of water and, and, and fish with, with skin problems called lesions. And, you know, fish are always are getting lesions and the scales and slime don't really fix them all the time. So this was not too surprised, but the illness was new. The illness was not just, I'm tired. It was, I'm tired and my brain doesn't work. I'm tired, my brain doesn't work and my joints hurt. Add to that diarrhea and secretory diarrhea was a real facet of the, of this problem, the skin problems, the diversity of, of lesions that we saw, biopsy just showed some lymphocytic infiltrate, not a, not a real clue along the way. But these people were, were acutely affected and guess how much of the world's literature there was on people like this one, zero. Yeah. So were they, were they just a gomer? And you remember where a gomer is, right? Get out of my emergency room. <laughs> Well, you know, these, these, these folks are people I knew. I would see them in Walmart. I'd see them on the street. We'd build a nature trail with them. So these are, these are good, and, uh, honest, hardworking people. And they're not making things up. They're not trying to get out of work. And mm -hmm. the story is, is heard over and over again. But interestingly, in 1997, a uh, TV announcer from Channel 7 out of Washington named Brad Bell sent a water sample from the Pocomoke down to a lab in North Carolina at NC State where Joanne Burkholder had been looking at an organism called Fisteria. Sounds like hysteria, but Fisteria had been active in the cup of the Pamlico Sound and Neuse River and what have you. And there are lots of problems with fish kills and anybody who said they were sick was almost hounded into silence. So no cases, no studies, no human illness. And lo and behold, we had Fisteria in the Pocomoke River. Well, what this little organism does is normally have a very slow moving you know, phase of its life where it kind of crawls along the bottom of a river. But if another Fisteria comes along and releases a toxin, that toxin is actually a pheromone. It's a signal for feeding and breeding. So you would get suddenly a bloom of fisteria organisms. They would make a cyst and drop back in the river and the way they went. Well, what happened that this new monster with multiple life forms could grow in our, in our river? The nutrients had no change. And they ended up being blamed, of course. Government officials like to do that. But what was new were additives to the water column. A blue mold was now wiping out tomatoes, wiping out tobacco, and areas where water would be run off during rain events into the North Carolina Sounds, what have you, into the Noose River, and the Pokemon River would be where we would see a sudden bloom that would come and go, feeding and breeding, and next, and it turned out what was toxic in the, in the water was copper in that it would kill things that the slow moving phase of hysteria would like to eat. And then there also were dithiocarbamates, special old fashioned uh, fungicides that killed off the things that ate hysteria. Mm -hmm. So you had a double whammy that says this organism is gonna be fast moving in the water column and it's going to not have any predators. Yeah. So it made toxins more and more and more and more and more people got sick and I got inundated with people. Richie, you gotta do something. Mm -hmm. So secretory diarrhea, well, you and I are old time family docs. We know full well that cholestyramine, a non-absorbable anion binding resin with an anion radius of 1.4 angstroms, will bind very nicely to negative charge uh, anions and make life easy because the match of what we saw in toxins later on was a ring, a negatively charged ring of about 1.43 angstroms that matched to 1.4 angstroms for the side chains of positive side chains of cholesteramine. And we had a mechanism now to stop what's called enterohepatic or GI, gastrointestinal liver recirculation because the toxin we made come out secreted against the gradient in the bile down into the duodenum, reabsorbed in the jejunum and on you go. People did not self heal unless very strange things happen. But you know, there's diarrhea, I couldn't fix, I tried everything, you know, Motrin and steroids and you know, anything that anyone uh, would do in practice would think about. But I said, why not use something to stop the secretory diarrhea, give people some sleep for God's sake, so they're not going 10 times in the middle of the night. 
And lo and behold, the very first patient in 1997 called me back two days later, says, boy, that stuff is great. Stop my diarrhea. Well, of course, I gave it to you for that reason. I'm glad to hear that. She goes, but you know, I, my memory is back and my, con- wow. my cough's gone and, and, I, and I, I can breathe through my nose and, and I'm not short of breath. I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, I had a bunch of people almost in charts sitting on my desk saying I haven't been able to help this person because the labs are all the same. Yeah. No, nothing, nothing abnormal at all. Just like we know today, normal sed rates, you know, mm-hmm. we didn't know then why high viscosity gave normal sed rates, but that's for another day. Yeah. But specifically what happened is that uh, I was faced with a decision. Am I going to be firing shotguns from a family practice gun that says, I'm going to give people medicine, even if I don't know the physiology, even if I don't know the pathophysiology, but if I can make them better, will I do something like that? Kind of like with COVID, people, yeah. you know, oh, what are they going to do? And we'll maybe we'll have time to talk about VIP and COVID, but it's a great story and uh, secretory physiology, tell you what. <laughs> but with that in mind, over 200 patients later, I had a winner because I still didn't have the physiology, but I had a mechanism that I could help people who are adversely affected. Well, guess what? There was some criticism, amazing. You know, it's a free country, so you can criticize Richie, you know? But that was done and needless to say, when I said copper and dithiocarbamates, nobody ever heard of such a thing. And yet when you disrupt chemical, chemically disrupt, I mean, you're, you're big into Roundup and all that stuff and <laughs> I can argue with you and you argue with me, so there we go. But specifically, if we are looking at an environmental source, an environmental disturbance, would that be different if it was a different organism besides a dinoflagellate? Well, here came the phone call from the St. Lucie River. We've got a problem with cryptoparadiniopsis. Mm-hmm. For 25 years, I can still remember that name. How about that? Mm-hmm. That's good. <laughs> Person, man, woman, camera, TV, right? Okay. Oh, no, it's somebody else. You know that joke? Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Maybe you and me only, but. <laughs> All right. Anyway. But anyway, sure enough, what happened in the St. Lucie River, which is on the east coast of Florida, is that when Lake Okeechobee fills up, the water that's breaching the, the, the top of 18 feet down of uh, Lake Okeechobee has got to be vended. And you can't put it in the Everglades and the Cape Sable Sparrow says you can't put it down in the Caloosahatchee. So they sent it through all the channels and canals into the St. Lucie. And as soon as they opened the C-73 lock, you knew that three days later, there was gonna be a bloom of dinoflagellates. And guess what was in that pore water that Florida proved? Maryland never did. It was copper and dithiocarbamates. Wow. So here we had the same thing. So blooms next in Lake Okeechobee. Well, my goodness, look at what's going on there. Of course, the Okeechobee in Florida, that part is full of phosphate in the water and you're going to be giving nurturing and nutrients to cyanobacteria. And every single state has got cyanobacteria. Yes. We think about the pond scum. But mm-hmm. sure enough, they had the same symptoms hysteria patients did. They had the same lab abnormalities. They were all zero. And by this time, we finally had a diagnostic test, visual contrast sensitivity, thanks to Ken Hudnell. And yeah, how did pull- that, um, that, that's brilliant that because that's such a, even though it's not specific, it's such a great tool. How did that come about? Was that research that you had found for biotoxins or how did you find that visual content? Ken was, was a neurotoxicologist for the US EPA. He was based in Research Triangle Park and he had studied by some uh, you know, organic compounds affecting the visual pathways. Yeah. Uh, and he could show a defect in dry clean workers as opposed to, you know, tetrachloroethylene and all these other things. And there's lots of stuff that I don't know about that they used. Yeah. Hydrocarbons would also cause a problem with the ability to see an edge where gray meets gray. You lose the ability to see an edge where black equals white, yeah. then you can see an edge. But if you turn down the black and make it grayer and you darken up the white to make it grayer, you'll find a point of extinction that you can't see a line that has a certain shade. And that point of extinction became the point that we could put on a graph and we could do the same test in multiple places and show the same abnormality. And then when we found that in Fisteria, because I called up Ken, because he was the first person in the world to publish on DCS and Fisteria, 
I said, Ken, I can fix this illness. And he says, well, look, let's do before and after VCS. And bingo, oh, yeah. within four days, we have an answer. We now have the first biomarker. But how come some people were swimming in Williams Point? There's 10 people, three people got sick, and seven people didn't. Well, it couldn't be drinking beer. Everybody in Somerset County drinks beer. You know that. <laughs> and, you know, what is cigarettes or age or disease? No, no, no. It wasn't until 2000. I started reading up on HLA and look at this. Here was immune response genes. Oh my God, there was no teaching back then in medical school. Yeah. And we knew about HLA B27, but not HLA DR. But anyway, sure enough, that was the answer. And we needed to collect enough data to prove that there was a genetic susceptibility as shown by increased incidence in cases compared to incidence in controls. And when that ratio exceeded 2.1, excuse me, 2.0 to 1, we had then relative risk. So we had now symptoms, we had normal laboratories, we had HLA, we had VCS. What else was there? Well, it turns out, here comes along 1998, uh, people with Lyme disease. Well, they had the same visual contrast deficit, same symptoms. I'll give them cholestyramine, same way I always do, and hope they didn't get constipated and hope all the good things happen. Well, they didn't. They weren't were able to take it long enough to get to, to figure it out. They did, they got slammed. They could barely lift their heads off the pillow. And sure enough, this was the first clue that cytokines were involved. When cytokines were involved, I started reading about VEGF and now low VEGF was involved. And now MMP9 told us about endotoxins and one after another. I think I have been the original publisher on 25 different biotoxin uh, biomarkers for SERS illness, chronic inflammatory response disease. And we have two more that we're coming out next week. But specifically, what we now were seeing was a commonality among exposure to biotoxins, which are small compounds, less than a thousand Daltons, teeny tiny little things. They had the ability to move from cell to cell, but more importantly, they had the ability to be secreted against the gradient out of bile to dump into the duodenum. And if we had cholestyramine, or thanks to Ray Stricker, Ray was the first from Lyme to say, try well call, and he was right. That worked. We could now come after these folks, but not everybody got better. And Tim Roberts from Australia was working with me on a different case. And tell me about this Marcons. Well, Tim told me about Marcons and sure enough, we had it too. And as time has gone on, Marcons have been a real flashpoint and it separates me and you here, just Jill, just to tell you the truth, because use of particular medications and antifungals especially will induce horizontal gene transfer and create massive antibiotic resistance in Marcons. And Marcons are, are boy, are they, they ubiquitous and they love to, to, to breed with anybody else and share uh, little bits of DNA and uh, antibiotic resistance factors. We knew from burn units, as soon as you use antifungals and antibiotics together in a bad burn, guess what? You had resistant fungi and resistant staphs. The same antibiotic resistance factors. Wow, amazing. And that's true to this day. So I'm going to argue about antifungals there. I'm really going to get you when we come to Jeannie, but that's all right. As time well, went on. All, I, I'm very good. I'm glad to hear your opinion and this and the science, because I really, I mean, I want to be the best scientist that I can. What I've seen that makes a difference is we have immune compromised. And that makes those people are the subclass that really is a different um, treatment group. And those people are full of opportunistic infections like fungal infections. And I find the antifungals ooh, and immune compromise ooh. to be life-saving. So tell me what the definition of immunocompromise is. Yeah, so uh, deficiency of total IgG. Um, and now the literature is supporting even deficiencies in IgM or IgE. That's a brand new definition, but classically the combined gamma, gamma globulinopathies, those are pretty severely ill people that cannot oh, mount. Boy, right good, good luck finding a lot of those cases. Uh, I used to track my immune globulin panels and finding a gamma globulin deficiency or any of the, of the four times of IgG was, was rare. But well, there's my population is very different though. See, that's why I think there is a difference in this. I, and I really like, I just have nothing but respect. So I, I love talking about this in a respectful way because I do believe sure. they're, right, they're overused. But on the other hand, I actually do have a large percentage of immune compromised patients. I don't know if that's just because of the people I treat. 
So it is a different ball game for them. They, they require antifungals in order to overcome because they cannot mount a response innately. Well, it's time you publish that and have yes, some you're right. review. You're right, you're right. I, mean, I want to say like- just tell me, because I'm gonna to wanna to see it appear in, in what, what do the data show? Yeah. And if, if you have, this is, this is something new, uh, and if it's legit, it'll stand up to peer review. Absolutely. And certainly uh, that's the way to go. But to go back to where we were talking, yeah. it became clear that in 1998, the first persons that I saw who had a Fisteria-like illness, who didn't have hysteria exposure, they were nowhere near the Pokemon River. All they had was a closet that was full of this black stuff that was growing when the roof leaked. Wow. So, so how many now, years is that between the first river exposure and the actual this mold? How, how, how long did that pass? How many years? 1997 and 1998. Got it. So by, the, by that time, we had our first mold patients before we had Lyme patients, but we had dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria as, as the first. But then there were some people that didn't get better. Marcons had to be eradicated. And back then we could use Beck spray very, with great results. Not anymore. But then it became clear that we fixed the, the cholestyramine deficiency or well called deficiency, fixed that, and, and Marcons was gone. People still were not getting better. Well, what else? Well, here, MMP9 elevation. Oh, my God, I can fix that, too. It's a marker for, for TH1 cytokines. And then we had this, the insight, well, how about low veg F? And then along came C4A. Oh my goodness, was C4A the big player? And finally in 2008, I begged, finally, beg, beg, beg. Because uh, all the time, but for example, with MMP9, uh, there was a lab called Esoterics outside Denver that agreed to do MMP9s for me. I was the only person in the country that had that data. I was the only person that had HLA. I was the only person treating this with cholestyramine. Yeah. Now, a few others came along later and they said they were the first, but you know, I published first. Anyway, having said all that, the same approach to classical science of looking at data of cases versus controls, prospective re-exposure trials to prove risk. That's the only way you can prove risk is prospective studies. So we had the sequential activation of innate immune elements and multiple papers along that way. And in litigation, and, and I, I hope you're doing litigation, but specifically we needed a voice to not only convince physicians, but also convince the attorneys because you don't change the law if you don't change the attorneys. Right. And the laws are dastardly. But anyway, the whole issue is that along with the legal testimony work, along came multiple publications and suddenly we had a robust literature. So the robust literature has continued to grow. And in 2003 and four, the Human Genome Project was going, you remember, you know, billion dollars. And they, what the hell in the world are they doing all this? And I don't understand all this stuff. But, you know, having said all that, uh, transcriptomics started evolving in 2005. And differential gene activation was sort of first got attention in cancer, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit in vascular disease, but still it's, 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 a, it's a Rosetta Stone that's, that's unscratched. Yeah. And along comes Jimmy Ryan, who's a transcriptomist, brilliant man. Uh, he started working with me and we see, we, Jimmy said, well, we need to raise a million dollars. Sure. How did you first connect? How did you connect with Jimmy? Was it with Ciguatero, a dinoflagellate illness. Jimmy was working at the National uh, Marine Biotoxin Lab in Charleston. And I went down to give some talks on Fisteria and Ciguatera, and he was doing stuff with John Ramsdale mm -hmm. that I didn't know about, and they didn't know about the human health center. Well, why don't we work together? And so that got started, you know, with the mold pieces. But in in 2010, when we published a paper on on Ciguatera, which is a marine dinoflagellate that makes people sell, uh, be sure and ask if people have had fish from the grow on a reef, part of your differential diagnosis. But having said that, nobody does. At any rate. When Jimmy was able to convince me to raise the money to buy a, a Lumina sequencer, next generation sequencing and RNA seq, we could see of the 50,000 genes that we could sequence in SERS patients, there were 2,000 that were always abnormal. We went to those 2,000 genes, looked at the greatest signal to noise ratios and looked at diversity. We wanted cytokine pathways. We wanted coagulation pathways. And we wanted to look at what was going on with lack of ribosomal RNA. Ribosomes weren't working right. We couldn't get mRNA to attach 
to start making a protein. We couldn't make you know, an amino acid added to a daisy chain for, so we didn't have elongation. We didn't have termination. These, 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 this RNA was not there. What was suppressing it? That led to discovery of the sarsen ricin loop. And remember, ribosomes have two big structures, the large subunit and the small subunit. They're sandwiched around a little tiny piece, which is where all this protein and amino acid stuff works. Sarsen, most people haven't heard of sarcoma inhib inhib inhibitors, but they have heard of ricin, a plant toxin. Mm -hmm. And ricin works by splitting off the adenosine moiety at, at position 15 on this loop that's necessary for this whole structure to work. And every single living creature, you name one, every single living creature has a sarsen ricin loop. And four billion years ago, look at the biowarfare we had, fungi dealing with spirochetes, my gosh, ciguatera, excuse me, spirochetes dealing with dinoflagellates, all this stuff going on, cyanobacteria making the first oxygen in the environment. These organisms made ribotoxins that would take the, the adenosine moiety out. They also made ribosomal inhibitory proteins and those compounds are with us today. They are creating the hypometabolism that starts with ribosomes mm -hmm. in the cytoplasm but extends to ribosomes in mitochondria, mitoribosomes. So if you've got a ribosome, well, that mean in the mitochondria, there's got to be a gene to program for RNA, right? Well, there were a thousand genes from mitochondria. Now there's 37 at last count, 37. Where'd the other thousand go? Well, you know, they migrated to the nucleus and they are nuclear encoded mitochondrial genes and they're subject to transcription factors. So the same transcription factors, oh boy, when I tell you about TGF beta one, oh my goodness the same transcription factors that are differentially associated with gene replication or activation or suppression. Remember there's four layers and this disease we're talking about is that disease is lack of regulation, mm -hmm. of lack of regulation, of lack of regulation, of lack of regulation of DNA transcription. And if you understand that, you'll see why nuclear transcription factors, microRNA, um, some of the long non-coding RNAs and then housekeeping genes are regulatory for gene transcription. You know, I see you'll hear a lot of people talking about, you know, methylation and all this stuff. And I just kind of yawn because you're missing the boat if you think about methylation because there's more methylators than there are methylators. There's more acetylators than deacetylators, but there's both of those are a constant. Yeah. So epigenetic stuff is four different structural layers of gene transcription. Don't don't start me on methylation, and it'll it'll ruin a good day. But oh, having said having said all that, to go a little further, what we found is that, or Jimmy found, not we, Jimmy found, is that a collection of mitochondrial encoded nuclear genes control ATP synthesis. Mm -hmm. And look at what we want. We want pyruvate to be broken down from glyco from glycogen and from, from glucose, we want glucose to be taken up by glucose transport proteins one and four, they're solute carriers, in comes glucose into the cell, there's other mechanisms as well, but there is the vital role of insulin and insulin receptors, then insulin receptor substrate two. Mm -hmm. This is regulating metabolic impact past like crazy. Yeah. And don't you know, Jimmy found abnormalities in metabolism as well. So we had ATP synthesis. You don't make ATP. The poor mitochondria is being victimized. People are saying this is a mitochondrial disease, for God's sake. No, it's not. It's just lack of, of ATP synthesis. Mm -hmm. And look at actinomycetes. Oh, my goodness. Look what they do. Pyrocyan A knocks out uh, complex one. Oligomycin knocks out complex three. We can affect the electron transport chain with actinos found in water damaged buildings. Oh my, who never heard of such a thing? Well, just wait till you see valenomycin and monensin and nigericin because those block the voltage dependent anion channel. Now, you know, and let me some of the other else you do now is that this little pore sits on the outside wall, the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And if it's open, you will have migrating inside the cell 
ions. Okay, that's a good idea. Solutes, okay. ADP, ah, that's where you make ATP from ADP. And pyruvate, ah, that's how pyruvate gets into the inner mitochondrial space. And, and then the transport protein will take it from the inner membrane and put it in the electron transport chain, Krebs cycle, that's when you use all your ATP. But if your pyruvate doesn't get in, what happens to it? It stays in the cytoplasm. Yeah. And pyruvate cannot be sitting around because it's gonna cause trouble. And pyruvate gets converted into what? Lactic acid, oh no. Lactic acid is secreted against the gradient but glucose is still being pumped in, making new compounds, and there will be diversion of those new compounds into the building blocks that the cell needs to reproduce. Oh. So let so me pause really quick, Dr. Shoemaker. This is brilliant. I'm following you every bit of the way. But cool. for our average listener, there's two things I want to talk about because I think you just mentioned basically for if you're listening and wondering this biochemistry that I find fascinating that Dr. Shoemaker is explain, explaining and brilliant. What, what he's talking about is the cellular energy makers, the, the, the energy producers in each cell, they're broken. And what we get from that is this exercise intolerance. He's talking about lactic being um, in the cytoplasm. And when that accumulates, you'll have that muscle soreness, the fibromyalgia, the chronic fatigue. So what he's describing is on a chemical, biochemical level, what happens when you, after you get exposed to mold or some of these other biotoxin pathways, the chronic fatigue, the fibromyalgia, the muscle pain, the exercise intolerance where you're sore two to three days later, this is the biochemical pathways, if, I, if I'm right, Right, Dr. Shoemaker, of what we see in the clinical practice. So it's so there's, relevant. There's, there's way more. There's yeah. way more. And I'm on a it's roll. <laughs> so let me get back on it. You're, you're, yeah. you're right to clarify. Thank you. So the question then comes, if we've got pyruvate being made into lactic acid and secreted against the gradient, mm -hmm. is there a medical condition for which we see extra lactic acid? Yeah, it's called metabolic acidosis. Yeah. And if the cell is getting ready to divide, making all these extra building blocks, that kind of physiology is called proliferative physiology. So proliferative physiology means you only get two molecules of ATP from each bit of pyruvate and four total for that whole situation. But you make building blocks and along comes this whole mechanism of lack of energy storage. Yeah. So you're now got metabolic acidosis and proliferative physiology what else goes with that? Now, I, I, I know that you've had some health issues in the past and mm -hmm. used to talk about it in public, so I'm not breaking any yeah, secrets. Not at all. <laughs> uh, I was disabled by pulmonary hypertension in 2012. It's the reason I stopped with medicine because the cardiologist said, put your things in order. Well, that's kind of nice words to hear. Wow. <laughs> so where did my pulmonary hypertension come from? So I started looking at people we could identify proliferative physiology. I'm going to get to that in just a sec. Mm -hmm. And we said, if they got metabolic acidosis, what else do they have? Mm -hmm. Well, lo and behold, 80% of them got pulmonary hypertension. 80% yeah. of them have T uh, regulatory cell deficiency. Yes. They all do. Yes. They all do. I agree. They all do. <laughs> and, <laughs> we see that. And, and, and that's like where the, the, they also get injury to gray matter nuclei, mm -hmm. injury to cortical gray and enlargement of superior lateral ventricle. Yeah. We can show the mechanism objectively without any guessing, without any ridiculous psychological exams. We can show in black and white, the definable objective pattern of injury. And we published a paper in 2017 mm -hmm. showing we can fix that. And we still can, we we're on a roll with that. So now we've gone from physiology of hysteria, what in the hell is that, to the molecular biology of proliferative physiology, as opposed to energy storage, associated with metabolic acidosis, associated pulmonary hypertension, associated Treg cell. Where's the autoimmunity come from? Where's all the tissue-based inflammation? Lack of T regs. Oh my gosh, T effector cells are being. Oh, I want to just pause really quick to clarify that again, just for the layperson. So we have TH17 and T reg cells. And then we have TH1 and TH2, but T reg cells are like the bodyguards. They're like, hey, calm down. Don't overreact. We don't need to react to too much out there. Everything's okay. And they help us not to be either overreactive to pathogens or overreactive to self and create autoimmunity. They're really important. If you don't have T reg cells, you're going to be a 
on fire for autoimmunity and on fire for inflammation and cytokine production. And most people in this illness have elevated TGF beta, which drives TH17 and a, a reduction in Treg cells, which is what Dr. Schumann- uh, there's, there's more, you haven't listened to me recently. There's way more. Oh yes, there's more. I'm trying to keep it really simple. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go back to what else did Jimmy Ryan show us? Mm -hmm. I talked about VDAC, this pore. It turns out translocases, and if you don't know what a translocase is, join the club. I didn't know, but it sounds like it moves from moves from one location to another, a translocase. This protein is necessary to move mitochondrial proteins through the pore and through this complex into the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And if your translocases are depressed or deficient, if you don't have that mRNA, will you get mitochondrial proteins coming into the inner matrix of the mitochondria? And the answer is no. So we've talked about actinos, and I mentioned probably too quickly that actinos disrupt VDAC, they do. Translocases affect VDAC as well. And it turns out the more genes that Jimmy started looking at, we started looking at beta tubulin and tubulin A4A. When we looked at the, the associated findings of people with abnormalities of these two cytoskeleton structures, these microtubule structures, we found that they had an, a mean of 6.15 gray matter nuclear atrophy and area atrophy out of eight total compared to controls that would have 0 0.9. So they were hugely abnormal. What do those tubulins do? Jill, can you answer my question? Is what do they do to the VDAC? No, tell me. <laughs> they block it. Okay. So proliferative physiology now, when we fix VDAC, we also can fix gray matter nuclei. We were using VIP in my protocol for them for uh, to fix gray matter nuclei atrophy. Didn't know we were fixing VDAC, but specifically we now had the the the, the, the poker hand that 90% of people with chronic fatigue illnesses, whether they're SERS patients, heart failure patients, cancer patients, renal failure patients, psychiatric fatigue patients, they if they have proliferative physiology they have hypometabolism. Mm -hmm. Now, the, that hypometabolism is made worse if IRS2 is elevated. Why? Let's pause IRS Dr. Schumacher, hypometabolism, you and I know what that is. Let's just describe for the average person, what does that actually mean? What is hypometabolism? Molecular hypometabolism or MHM is not the same as hypometabolism. I try to save time. But this is suppression of RNA genes suppression of mitochondrial genes, mm -hmm. suppression of mitoribosomal nuclear genes. So all these gene suppression due to impairment of the sarsen ricin loop is mm -hmm. where this illness comes from. It's real simple. It's real simple. And all this gobbledygook, it's real simple. If you've got hypometabolism, you're gonna have proliferative physiology. If you got proliferative physiology, you will do worse. If you start having problems with the insulin receptor substrate that opens the door to let more glucose in, therefore more pyruvate, therefore more lactic acid. And if you say, I'm gonna use a keto diet, my cringe yeah. buzzword, you either get glycolysis, and if you've got IRS2, glycolysis is going nuts, you either get glycolysis or you've got fatty acid oxidation. Yes. And if you got fatty acid oxidation, glycolysis will be depressed. But if you get glycolysis upregulation, which we do if you're if you're proliferative, the keto diet is not going to work. Mm -hmm. You'll get a lot of placebo effect, but in terms of glycolysis and, and physiology, you won't get what you want. Well, so I just want to comment because in clinical practice, what I have seen is exactly what you're describing. I completely understand there's a percentage of people that do not do well on a keto diet, nor should they be doing it because they don't have the ability to utilize um, the alternatives for fuel. Don't use keto if you've got molecular hypometabolism. Later on, if IRS2 is suppressed, your keto works fine. Mm -hmm. But if IRS2 is up, it doesn't work fine. There's a reason for that. And but, this is also why we're basically seeing the induction of prediabetes, diabetes, metabolic um, syndrome. Well, there's, there's multiple mechanisms, including, remember these assimilation pathways I was telling you that glucose can, can use to, to make cell division. You also will have the hexose aminidase a uh, synthetic pathway that results in creation of insulin resistance. Yeah. Now that's by, by action on, 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 uh, on, on fat cells. 
uh, not by glucose. So we need to change our thoughts. There also is intracellular uh, insulin resistance from monensin and nigerisin, which is uh, something that for another day, but that's, that's what actinomycetes do. So the, there's multiple ways to impair glucose metabolism. But here we go now, what else do we see in Gini? Apoptosis of programmed cell death is a mechanism to take care of cells that are programmed to die. And Granzyme show a label a cell saying it's your time to go. And here come natural killer cells, provided they've got a T cell synapse and they don't in SERS, aha. Uh -huh. Well, and, and apoptosis, again, just to clarify for those of you listening, apoptosis is how we don't get cancer. It's how we take dead cells and tell them, hey, get out of here. Don't be a nuisance. Don't cause trouble when their cell life is over for simplistic form. Well, if we don't remember, have remember, when, when you make it easy, remember, the apoptosis starts with mitochondrial changes. Mm -hmm. Mitochondria rules a classical yeah. pathway for apoptosis. Because now, they're targeted when they're mitochondrial dysfunction for cell death. Well, I'm going to disagree with that one. That's all right. I've uh, got a nice lecture showing the mechanisms that will go along with that. They're a little separate. Activation of capsaic signals are, are, are not, uh, not, not the same. Specifically, what we're looking at is programming a cell to die and packaging cell components like DNA and RNA and mitochondria and you know, endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes, packaging them inside of a membrane so that when they're released into circulation, that membrane protects the contents from being recognized as a foreign invader. Like dams and PAMs, like damage associated uh, pathogens. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure, but what we're looking at at 15% of SERS patients and 15% of chronic illness patients have defective apoptosis. Mm -hmm. And they all have RIPK1, a gene that goes in, that interacts with RIPK3 that will kill the cell. Now COVID uses this pathway, HIV mm -hmm. uses this pathway, so it's, you pay attention. This cell will be killed if it's harboring a virus most commonly. The virus can block apoptosis, but the cell says, okay, you've blocked apoptosis, Mr. Virus, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna commit suicide with necroptosis. There's 12 of these optoses. Or, and specifically what will happen here is that there will be a release of the cell contents without membrane packaging. So you have an endogenous inflammatory cascade like crazy. Yes. Where does this, is a, this is a cell danger response that Dr. Niveau wrote about. Well, we're gonna talk about that because what comes first, the gene activation or gene suppression or mitochondrial response. So that's that's still in there. And by the way, when, when, when Dr. Navio was writing about that, he was saying that that is part of the dour physiology, this, this uh, nematode called uh, C. elegans he has been well studied. That goes in dour as a stage of hibernation. That is not what we call uh, oxidative glycosylation. It's deoxidative. So it's, it's anaerobic. So aerobic glycolysis versus anaerobic glycolysis. So what Bob was talking about is anaerobic glycolysis effect. This is aerobic glycolysis. It's very important to make that distinction. So now we're looking at other elements of Gini. How about coagulation? We've got Jimmy's published and I've been co-authoring a paper since 2015 that in biotoxin illnesses, coag genes are upregulated. And lo and behold, here is this ton of work uh, out of Rochester Rockefeller University uh, in New York City, looking at the vascular hypothesis for neuronal injury. And I'm sure you're familiar with that because here we have coagulation elements will be bound to ApoB, excuse me, oh, well, I'm blocking, be bound to one of the precursors in Alzheimer's to bind, to make a clot in the vascular bed. That clot will create a distal hypoxia so that more of bad guys, more tall will be made. And this, so that we've got APO, A and B and all these, it's, it's just amazing. But what if you've got coagulation genes upregulated, will you make more coag products to be bound in the brain? Yes. And you can look at the difference between the 10 genes we look at for coag. If you've got two upregulated, you'll have two or three genes that are, that, are, that are too small. But if you've got four genes upregulated for coag, the mean number of gray matter nuclear atrophy is 4.5, mm -hmm. just, just from the coag genes. Now, I told you a couple of times that I wanted you to go back to be thinking about TGF-beta-1 yeah. 
as it turns out, because we're running out of time, as it turns out, if we are looking at the fundamental difference between you and me, I see exposure, you see exposure. Mm -hmm. I see immune reactivity. I'm not sure you do. And the difference is exposure, who, so what? Who cares if you're exposed? It turns out if you have a proteomic response, that person should care. But if you have the immune response, that illness is very, very different and much worse. For years, I have said, I cringe when I see certain HLA types, 4353 and 11352 b saying these are the dreaded. Well, as it turns out, the link from exposure, and we can measure, hopefully you're using a lab that will measure of species abundance, not, not just one species, not, not just uh, Streptomyces griseus that you get for, uh, from mycometrics. There's nothing wrong with that, but we're looking for species abundance. We use uh, viral biomics. I have no, no plug for them. There's no, no conflict of interest. But if we look at the actinos in this whole situation, what we are looking at is mechanisms to show exposure. And then we can look at particular immune markers, and that's proprietary, that will show us that there has been a reaction to the actino compounds. These are intracellular compounds. Actinos make more compounds than anything else. It's, a, it's the biggest species of all, or biggest genius of all in microbiology. But actinos, if they are exposed and there is immune response, there will be activation of TGF beta-1 receptor one, two, or three. And that receptor links to SMAD, all the different SMADs, nuclear transcription factors. So now we've got the mechanism more common in 4353 by far, 22 times what normal population is in people with exposure and reactivity. But if you get activation of this receptor, the downstream pathways, not just SMAD, not just nuclear transcription, but they also are the same basic building blocks that insulin receptors do. It is the link of metabolism to inflammation in a brand new way. And this is stuff we publish for the first time next week. So it is, it's uncanny. So now we're looking at the link and saying, all right, do you have a link for actinos? Yes. Do you have a link for mycotoxins? Yes. Do you have a link for endotoxins? Oh, yeah, we do. CD14 and TOL4. Well, which is more common in a thousand mold patients now? What's more common? Is those links that turn on if you're exposed to mycotoxins? No, they're not first. Actinos are first. How about mycotoxins being number two? No, endotoxins are number two. Mycotoxins are 7% of the problem. 7% of the immune responses. So the activity of this whole met metabolic structure of the basic difference between proliferative physiology versus energy conservation should make sense. Biology has limited mechanisms to, to act upon. We don't have a million different genes. Uh, we got 50,000, that's, yeah. that's plenty. But specifically, no, go, go ahead. I, I got one more point well, to make. No, I was just going to say, I want to link to it because uh, LPS endotoxemia has always been a big plug for me. I really, even with COVID, we see the underlying cytokine activation by LPS is underlying 90% of the illness in the United States. And even in, in a water damaged building, I, what you're saying is mold is not the primary trigger. It's endotoxic. No, it's, it's, it's not. I want you to read a little bit more about red blood cells' ability to, to bind to endotoxins to endothelium. So this whole idea, every, every time you get a bowel movement or you pee or you uh, have some intimate activity, there will be endotoxins in blood, mm -hmm. but red cells take care of them pretty fast. So be, be careful on that one. I want to go back to a couple well, other- All I want to say there though, is the data on endotoxemia, there, there is so much literature to support. Like you want to talk about the most research out there, endotoxemia has a lot of data to support it as the- And the mechanism by which you get sustained endotoxemia has a very crummy literature. It's yeah. a very small literature. I would agree. I totally, I, I totally agree. I just wanted to clarify because I think we agree on more than you think we do. <laughs> but So I know you have to go, but why don't you go the last maybe five minutes or so kind of summarize 
And just for those of you listening, Dr. Schumacher is talking about the Genie test. I will include links on his recently published article and then when the next one comes out. So I'll be sure and get those links from you, Dr. Schumacher, and include those. And then I will also include information on the test that you're talking about because a lot of people are asking what's Genie, what they want to know more. You'd have to work with your doctor to get it ordered. Is that correct, Dr. Schumacher? Yes, mm -hmm. the CLIA license will be coming around before long. Yeah, a couple of things I wanted to touch on. There are a lot of folks in the chronic fatigue world think that viral activation is a big deal. And they say it is, say it is, say it is. Fortunately, compounds made by neutrophils called defensins will be activated if there are viral infections. So we give you two defensins. I saw that. Say, and you can actually, with the genie, help to identify which persons are more affected by viral activation or not. Viral or not viral, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually about less than 10% of, of all, all of the total. But similarly, bacterial infection. Here's the easiest way to detect Bartonella, by the way. Mm -hmm. Lyme, the mechanisms that we use for the, that were published in Transcriptomics of Lyme in 2016, uh, Bouquet's paper was with John Alcott and, uh, and Charles Chu from UCSF. Uh, we, we can tell you if you don't have Lyme disease, uh, in the last six months, we can tell you if you're, mm -hmm. if you've been treated in the last six months, it's kind of neat. The other thing that's bothered me for so long has been chemical sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take just one minute. I've seen plenty of people with chemical sensitivity. I can recognize them when I talk to them, but finding an accepted case definition for chemical sensitivity, good luck. Mm -hmm. You've seen people with, with food sensitivities. You've seen people with uh, drug sensitivities. It all turns out that if we look at Icarus, the anti-inflammatory pathway and add up Icarus, if Icarus is positive and VIPR1, this VIP receptor is negative, those people are chemically sensitive. Mm. And the low dose VIP protocol we got will fix that Icarus VIP and fix the chemical sensitivity. We're gonna publish that very soon, but it's okay. just fascinating. The other piece for Jeannie that people need to know is that the marker for SIRS, the marker for persistent illness is lack of normal antigen presentation. Yeah. In defective antigen presentation, we know about HLA, we've talked about HLA, but look at the antigen presentation of the dendritic cell, the professional antigen presenting cell to a naive T cell, mm -hmm. aha, CD3D. Boom, we can look at that with one test. We can look at CD48. What we're really looking at now has to do with histamine for folks who think they've got mast cell activation mm -hmm. syndrome. If the genes for histamine are upregulated, you don't have mast cell activation. You've got genes that are the basis of histamine release. Mm -hmm. That's why so many people with mast cell activation will have normal triptases and normal yeah. granite A because they don't have the disease. Mm -hmm. They've got instead histamine release. And the last thing to say is that relapse, one of the, we, we stratify people by five stages. Stage one is treatment naive. Stage two is after my protocol. Stage three is after VIP. Stage four is off VIP, cured. But the fifth stage is relapse. Mm -hmm. Within two days, 100% of patients with re-exposure and reactivation of immune reactivity those people will have return of proliferative physiology. We treat that effectively with the protocol. It's so nice that you have that thing. And return of IRS2 upregulation within two days. Wow. So the next prospective study is going to be take volunteers, usually those in litigation or willing to do anything, and do the SIA protocol that wins the legal cases very nicely, but break down the re-exposure on day one into four hour increments so we can see how fast does the proliferative physiology occur. Wow. I think it'll be less than eight hours. Yeah, Eight hours, that's all it takes. Unbelievable, and yet I, I completely believe it. I should say, it's, I mean, truly, that's the that's fascinating. So you've got a paper coming out soon. You'll have to be sure and send that to me, and I'll share it with everybody who's listening. And then as these come out, we'll have to get on here again and talk about your your next data set with um, exposure and um, hypometabolism and how quickly that occurs. And immunoreactivity. Yes. Yes. The and, link. And the link between inflammatory illness and metabolic illness, they go hand in hand. You cannot deal with this illness without both the animal elements. 
Absolutely. Well, Dr. Shoemaker, thank you so much for your generous time with us today. I know um, everybody's just really enjoying this. There's lots of comments. I'll have to go back and post. I'll be sure and share with you the link here and then when it's on YouTube um, in case you want to um, share or use it in any way. And I, I really do appreciate your time and your expertise. And thank you as always for being such a leader in this field. We greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you for those kind words. It's good words to go home on. Yep. See you. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.